Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alan Saba. I'm a partner at Cirrus Consulting Group. I'd like to thank you all for taking the time today to join us um, on this webinar on cost-saving strategies for the health and longevity of your dental practice. I'm delighted to be joined today by my colleague, Andrea Chan, a partner uh, at Admin P, Myers Norton Penny, um, one of the largest accounting firms in the country. And uh, we've uh, done quite a bit of speaking and lecturing together. So I'm delighted that Andrea has had the time today to join us on this webinar. What we will be doing over the next roughly 40 minutes is basically talking in, in, in brief about um, from a real estate perspective and obviously a financial accounting perspective, what are the things that really should be important and relevant from a cost management perspective uh, in terms of uh, the, the health of your dental office and, uh, and the practice itself. Just a bit of background on who we are. Cirrus Consulting Group was founded in 1994, roughly 23 years ago, um, in initially by a group of dentists in Western Canada. And so since then, we have migrated to setting up our corporate offices in Toronto. And since inception, we've negotiated over 10,000 dental office leases. Uh, on an annual basis, we represent roughly 1,000 doctors. We have a wonderful in-house legal leasing and consulting group. We speak uh, roughly 150 times a year. And uh, obviously, our, our courses and lectures are CE accredited. And I've had the pleasure of lecturing at most large dental conventions across both Canada and the United States, um, considered an industry expert on commercial real estate specifically for dentists. And uh, the breadth of our experience not only covers representing commercial tenants, uh, principally dentists, but also dentists that own real estate and act as their own landlord in their uh, practices and their businesses. Um, what we're going to speak about today, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, specifically as it relates to the real estate to determine if you're overpaying in rent. Um, one of the areas of key concern, obviously, on, on most practice profit and loss statements is the fact that rent is one of the three largest expenses, aside from payroll and sundries. And uh, most doctors essentially don't really technically understand how base rents are set, whether you're in Toronto or Halifax or in the West. Um, and ultimately, as well, what constitutes your, your operating costs or your triple nets. I'll talk a little bit about how to identify risks that are found in most dental office leases and how to prepare for a negotiation so that not only do the non-economic considerations get addressed, but that the rent rates are, are carefully, carefully understood and negotiated at the time of the renewal. And then lastly, the, the, one of the, the most significant questions we get here at the firm virtually daily is basically questions on operating costs or common area maintenance or triple nets. And very, very few doctors really understand how these fees are calculated by landlords and uh, never audit, never reconcile, and they simply pay them on a, on a monthly basis. And so we'll speak a little bit about operating costs. And then finally, to talk about what lease negotiation strategies um, are, and uh, you know, principally how, how having the right lease agreement in place is a key attribute uh, pre-sale. So for any of you that are on the webinar today that are contemplating a, a sale of your practice within the next three to five years, essential that you have a close look and review of your office lease agreement so that you can ensure that when you sell the practice, the lease is an asset and not a liability through the sale process. A uh, question that we generally ask, um, interestingly, it sounds like a fairly simple, straightforward question, but it actually is not in, in that, you know, we ask ourselves constantly, what is a lease agreement? And after debating this for many, many years, we've come up with one very basic, simple answer, that a lease agreement is a, fundamentally a check. And uh, generally, we, we've, we've understood that, the, that this is, you know, will represent the largest check that you all will write in your professional careers. If you take the sum of all the rents that you pay based rent and operating costs over your tenancies, which could be 25 or 30 years, that I can assure you that the sum of all of that rent will in fact represent the largest check that you write. And so, you know, generally what we advise our doctors is that the, the first few pages of leases typically have um, high level terms, you, who is the tenant, what are the, the lease rates, et cetera. But then the, the 50 or 60 pages that accompany that, that first or second page are principally uh, essentially spelling out the legal terms, the covenants that uh, you will be governed by. 
The lease agreement is critically a fundamental, important uh, contract in that inherently what it should provide is long-term stability and security. Generally speaking, what we like to see are dental office leases that have 10 years of term. Um, not a fan of short-term dental office leases because the landlords know that it's you know, very expensive for you to have to ever consider a relocation or a move. And so, as a tenant, what you're looking for is long-term stability. So 10 years with ideally two five-year options to extend. And if I were to be advising or counseling a potential buyer or, or a young associate buying your practice, lease term will be absolutely critical for them for two reasons, to give them predictability over being able to practice in the space and to be able to obtain financing from a, a lender with respect to the acquisition of the practice. Number two, the lease agreement should minimize risk and exposure. Roughly 50% of the leases that I personally review, the doctor himself or herself is the named tenant. And so Dr. Jim Smith is named personally as a tenant in the lease. If any of you have provided uh, that level of, of, of security, if you will, to the landlord, in essence what you've done is you've provided personal guarantee for the duration of your lease. What we typically like to see is that the lease agreement be in the name of a corporation, typically your professional corporations, and that if the landlord is adamant that they want to see a personal guarantee, that we negotiate how much guarantee we provide for them, and we simply don't provide for them an unconditional guarantee. Flexibility is absolutely critical, and so you know situations such as can you bring in associates, can you bring in a subtenant, um, are you able to, if you're a general dentist, practice periodontics or endodontics? And so the lease agreement should absolutely provide for lots of flexibility for both you as a tenant and for the future purchaser of your practice. The lease should provide fair and affordable financial terms. And so this is a very interesting point because what we've learned in all these years in the real estate business is that basically the, the, that fair market rent simply means whatever the landlord can get you to pay. One of the services that we offer is a complimentary review of an office lease. And so one of the things we do within that review is we are very careful in analyzing your market rents. And uh, we do that by leveraging uh, proprietary data that we subscribe to, as well as 25 years of real estate data that we've amassed internally. And so we're very easily able to determine what the fair market rents are from, from Victoria to Halifax and everything in between. Essential, though, that you clearly understand how your base rents have been set and what they are and principally how they escalate on an annual basis. And then lastly, the lease agreement should enhance your ability to eventually sell your practice. And as I mentioned earlier, if, in, if you're contemplating a sale within the next three to five years, essential that you start to look at every part of the practice now to determine you know, what, what, what impacts they will have on the value. For example, if you have one year remaining in your lease agreement, that the purchaser will face a daunting task of either possibly considering a relocation of your practice or of having to renegotiate a lease renewal after they acquire your practice with the landlord knowing intimately well that your appetite to move is very low. And so, Typically, what the young buyer or young associate doctors are looking for is lots of lease term. And so if you're contemplating a sale, have no concerns about signing a 10-year lease, bearing in mind that it needs to be structured well. With respect to general dentistry and general practices, there are principally three key components to determining practice value. Um, neither Andrea or I are practice brokers, nor do we basically portray to be brokers. But in essence, what we've learned in all of the years with general dentistry is that the three key components to determining practice value are principally, number one, the equipment. So what is the equipment worth in its depreciated form? And number two, the goodwill, so your charts. And number three is your location. And you know, my apologies, doctors, as I am slightly biased, but I would argue that the location is a significant part of the value. But for illustrative purposes, I think inherently what I'm arguing here is that um, having been in the business for about 25 years and been involved in hundreds of, of buy sales, that for general dentistry, not specialists, that generally these are the three key attributes and components that get appraised at time of appraisal, uh, and then ultimately a value gets placed upon them. I want to cover off just a few of the key concerns uh, that we typically find in leases. And so one of the first things that I'd like to talk about is the base rents. This is principally the topic of today's conversation. 
the annual base rent is basically typically in the country a price per square foot that you as a commercial tenant will pay. And the price per square foot will vary very dramatically depending upon where your practice is situated. If you're downtown Toronto or if you're in the rural parts of Ottawa um, or in the prairies, generally there's, there's uh, analysis that, that goes into determining you know, what fair market rents are. Principally, if the property is newer, the rent rates may be slightly higher. Um, but what we typically look for are occupancy costs that, that are approximately 8% of your total production. So when we're looking at a practice that's producing a million dollars a year, if we see that occupancy costs are, say, between 8 and 9% uh, total, that those are typically the ratios we like to see. Um, if we see that the numbers are higher, so for example, if you're paying $150,000 a year in occupancy costs and your, produ your production is $900,000, we know that the, the two causes are basically that A, either the practice is underproducing, uh, is in space that it really shouldn't be, um, or B, you're simply overpaying in rent. Um, for those of you that have built out practices, and basically received a construction allowance or a tenant inducement, an improvement loan, if you will. Um, please know that that's not free money and that generally what landlords are doing is they are essentially incorporating that into the calculation of your base rents. And so if you were looking at a space, for example, that was $25 a square foot 10 years ago and the landlord was basically willing to provide you with a $100,000 improvement loan, that generally what most do is they recapture that loan through the increase of your base rents. And so very, very important to take a close, very close look at the price per square foot because if you in fact took an inducement loan, a construction allowance if you will, and uh, that was somehow factored into the calculation of your base rent, then you, you've been basically paying the landlord an extra dollar or two or three per square foot over the years that you've been a commercial tenant. Securing reasonable rates initially will allow you to remain profitable. So one of the things that we typically advise young doctors that are going into private practice is to, very, is to pay very close attention to the base rents. And so I know that Andrea may comment um, later on, on cash flows and cash flow projections and profitability, um, but we're very big proponents of advising our, our, our younger doctor associates that are moving into private practice to take a very pragmatic conservative approach with, with minimizing expense particularly in the first three to five years of practice ownership when the practice production is not you know, nearly what its potential is. Um, for those of you that are in leases, pay close attention to your escalations. And so the escalation is the annual increase in rent. Uh, typically what I like to see in the annual escalation is that the escalation is a percentage typically attributed to CPI or the Consumer Price Index. Um, but unfortunately every day in the practice here what I see are leases that you know, escalate by $1 a square foot or $2 or $3. And if you calculate the percentage of the escalation annually, if it's greater than 3 or 4%, it's, it's unreasonable. And the landlord is basically taking advantage of you as a commercial tenant. Protecting rental rates and unreasonable escalations by caps are, are absolutely critical. And so generally what we find is that in the options to renew provisions, and so the, this is the, the, the provision that allows for you to extend your tenancy as a commercial tenant, that there is a sentence in the option provision that states that the, the rent calculated will not be less than the prior year of term. And so, for example, if you signed a lease 20 years ago and you're paying $20 a square foot and your rent has been increasing by 5% per year and you're paying $32 a square foot at the end of the term, that the option provision structured with that provision that states that the, le the rent will not be less than the year, the, the, what you paid in the prior year of term, in, in essence guarantees the landlord that your base rent in the first year of the option period will not be less than the last year of your initial term. And in essence, doctors, what's happening is that, that rent will never go down. Operating costs. So this is a topic that I, I sometimes lecture on for hours because it's a highly complex initiative. Um, in essence, what, what operating costs are, if you're a triple net tenant, which most are now in the country, it basically means that you are paying your proportionate share to, to essentially run the building. So if a building, for example, requires $100,000 a year to run itself, and so it pays for its utilities, its property tax, its maintenance, its insurances, et cetera, 
What typically occurs is that if you occupy 20% of the building in, in square footage, in net um, rentable square footage, that the landlord will charge you your proportionate share of the operating costs. So in all of your leases, doctors, I strongly encourage you to review the, the page or two that speaks to what the operating costs are. Because unfortunately, in many office leases, landlords include um, administrative fees and, and other expenses that quite frankly have no bearing uh, being in the lease and being borne by its commercial tenants. Um, the other interesting fact, doctors, is that we do um, audits and CAM reconciliation. So we want, in essence, we, we want to review that what the landlord is charging you is to be truthful and correct. And unfortunately, there are a number of situations after we've completed a reconciliation or an audit where we find that the tenant is overpaying in occupancy costs. And so my second bullet there is critical in that what we do in our leases is we include what we, what we call an audit right or a right to review the statements. Uh, typically what happens now is that each of you will receive a one-page document from your landlord that will basically give you a high-level summary of what the operating costs are. Every two to three years, it's actually very good practice to basically audit that one-page summary to ask the landlord for proof that, in fact, the costs have been incurred and that, you know, that, that they're legitimate and that they're simply not, simply not put on a one-page summary document. Unreasonable operating costs being charged by the landlord. So I thought I would just increase um, some, of the, some of the examples, sorry, are improvements made to increase the property value. So if the, if the landlord is basically redeveloping or impl improving the aesthetics of the property to essentially drive the value of that asset up, that's really an unreasonable expense for them to pass on to. A building repair is a replacement of structural components. One of the things that I often hear from doctors is that the landlord is upgrading uh, support columns or, or heating and air conditioning systems or, or, or elevators that really are, are structural and, and major repairs that should be borne by the landlord. Real estate broker commissions, interesting also that um, every year if you're in a strip plaza or, or a building that the landlord is hiring a real estate brokerage to negotiate lease renewals, they're paying commissions to those commercial brokerages based on the price per square foot and the term and the amount of square feet that the tenants are renewing for. And very often in the operating expenses, the landlord will try to recapture those commissions through the operating expenses to its tenants. Professional fees not relating to your space. So we've seen things such as um, legal expenses, accounting expenses that had completely nothing to do with the space that you were occupying, but once again were generically written into the occupancy cost provisions. Interest on principal payments on mortgages or debt costs, um, unless clearly it is stipulated that, in, that your debt or your tenant improvement allowance is part of the, allow, as part of the operating costs or triple nets or camps. Marketing association fees as well that are, that are not driving traffic to the building or helping your business. So for example, if you have a large institutional landlord, um, there are a dozen or so in the city of Toronto, for example, that is generically advertising and promoting its brand, it really has no material benefit to your practice and, and to the traffic uh, that, the, that the, the, the building is trying to drive to the practice. CAM charges fluctuate from year to year. I mean, this is something that we've heard, again, many doctors complain about why aren't they fixed and why isn't it like my base rent? And so the reality is, is that their costs fluctuate every year to run the building. And so it's perfectly reasonable and fair for your proportionate share of occupancy costs to change as well. And earlier I talked about the right to audit. And so this is an absolutely critical provision that we typically insert into every lease. Um, but I would highly, highly recommend for those of you on the call to look at your leases and to ensure that you have audit rights in the lease. I just want to talk in closing for a few minutes about a few of the key provisions that are in the lease that are highly problematic with respect to economics. The assignment provision, which is basically in, in every lease, but this example is found in roughly 75% of leases. The assignment provision essentially provides for the process by which the landlord will determine um, how they will either approve or deny the consent to transfer the lease. In this particular example, what you'll notice that firstly, you have to get consent of the landlord. It states nothing in here about what reasonable or unreasonable consent is. And so for example, if you have been in your space for 25 years and you're selling your practice 
Nothing prevents the, the, the landlord from simply denying the transfer request to the prospective purchaser. Number two, this provision here has a termination right in it. And essentially what, what it stipulates is that the landlord, simply by you requesting the right to transfer your lease, sell your practice in essence, they can do one of two things. They can either terminate your lease altogether or they can increase the rent to be paid. And so you can imagine that landlord termination light rights are awful for dental office leases. And then finally here, for those of you earlier that uh, I'd asked, um, if you're contemplating a sale within the next three to five years, whether you've provided personal guarantees in your lease or not, or your lease is in the corporation name, the professional corporation, whomever is listed on page one as the tenant and whatever entity has provided a guarantee, whether it's you personally, yourself and your spouse, that once the landlord approves the transfer request, that those people will continually have liability into perpetuity. And that is absolutely critical that that gets carefully reviewed prior to ever going anywhere near a landlord with respect to trying to sell. Many other provisions, doctors, that are in office leases, I mean, we can spend hours discussing them, but, but some of the principal critical ones here that I've identified are options to renew. So try to have a 10-year lease term and try to have at least two five-year options to extend. That will give you 20 years of predictability and continuity in the space. Relocation and demolition provisions, doctors, are very, very harmful to dental office leases. Um, very common in most of the major cities, uh, but really need to be carefully reviewed because they pose undue risk for prospective purchasers that at any given time the landlord can relocate your practice or can terminate your lease if in the event they are desiring to redevelop or demolish the building. And then lastly, doctors, death and disability is critical. It should be in every single dental office lease. A death and disability provision simply provides for a termination right, God forbid you pass, um, that your estate will have a termination right on the lease, or God forbid you, be, you were to become disabled, that you again would have a termination right in the lease. Um, critical dates, tracking are absolutely critical. Please, doctors, know when your lease expires. If, you're, if you do not know when your lease expires, it is essential that you know when the lease expiry is because if you become a month-to-month -month tenant, you will become what is referred to as an overholding tenant, which basically means you, your lease can be terminated within 30 days anytime they want to. You will have an overholding provision in your lease and it will stipulate that generally speaking, the landlord can increase your rent at least one and a half to two times your base rents. So please pay close attention to the overholding provisions in the lease. You can imagine that my last point there, that if in the event you had to demolish or renovate, uh, if the building were to be demolished or renovated and you had to move your practice, that you know, typically 125 to 200 dollars a square foot to build a dental practice anywhere in the country, uh, very expensive to have to do that. So please do not be a month-to-month -month tenant. Just a final few slides on the tenant lease cycle. Um, my apologies is that it's not appearing well on screen, but in essence, the, the, the spirit of this slide, doctors, is that when your lease is within two years of its expiry, that is the time for you to engage in discussions with your landlord or to seek professional help for, for, from an organization that can help you do that. The closer you get to your lease expiry, the less leverage you will have. We have a complex seven-step process that uh, we typically guide our clients through. Um, I'm not going to spend too much time on it, but basically for those of you that are contemplating you know, negotiating your leases on your own or soliciting the help of a professional, just ensure that there is a complex and, and, a, and a very disciplined approach to representing the commercial tenant and to negotiating the lease. Uh, my final slide this morning is there is a service that we offer. It is a critical dates and risk analysis service. It has a cost of $1,495. We typically spend three to four hours analyzing your lease and then typically get on a call for an hour or two to basically run you through uh, two things, uh, analysis on your base rents, and to give you candid opinions on, you know, are you underpaying, are you at market rent, or are you overpaying, et cetera. And that will go through the lease agreement uh, cover to cover. One of our consultants would do that here at the firm. Um, if any of you are interested in the critical dates and risk analysis, we're waiving our fees. So it is a complimentary offering for those of you that are on today's webinar. With pleasure, it would be uh, our pleasure to, to review your leases and to, to run a real estate prospectus to talk to you about your base rents.
I want to thank everyone for the time. I'm going to turn over to Andrea now at to MNP to uh, basically complete our, uh, our webinar. Great. Thank you so much, Alan. So I'm going to switch gears a bit and, and talk about taxes. So as you know, in July, the Canadian government made the most significant amendments to the taxation of private corporations since the 70s. So today we're going to give you a summary of what those changes are and talk about some planning opportunities that you might want to take advantage of. Um, we have a niche that specializes in helping dentists across the country save taxes. So this topic is very near and dear to our hearts. So in July, finance basically proposed changes to the tax law so that it will make it more difficult for business owners to income split using their corporation, including the multiplication of their capital needs exemption. They also did not want business owners to have the ability to defer taxes by keeping funds inside their corps. Finally, they wanted to shut down planning opportunities that allow shareholders of a corporation to convert income that would otherwise be a dividend or salary into a capital gain. So because we work with so many dentists, the Canadian Dental Association asked us to put together numeric examples as part of their response to finance's um, July draft legislation. So here's an excerpt of that submission. We looked at the effect that this would have on incorporated dentists across Canada. And as a group, there are over 14,000 incorporated dentists in, in Canada, and we're expecting that as a group to lose about $216 million in cash as a result of this draft legislation. So the reality is, if you have a corporation, this draft legislation will affect you. Depending on your situation, everyone will be affected differently. And as a reminder, in Ontario, here is a breakdown of the highest rates of personal tax if your income is over $220,000. It may vary a little bit across the country, but this is a good baseline. So salary is taxed at 53.5%. Ineligible dividends at just over 45%, um, and capital gains basically at about 27%. So these rates will be important when we walk through some of the examples and planning opportunities later on in the seminar. So as a result of lobbying and responses submitted to finance, the government did amend the original proposal. So first, they committed to lowering the small business tax rate from the current 15% in Ontario to 13.5% in 2019. So unfortunately, this also means that the personal tax rates on ineligible dividends will increase by about 1%, so 45% that we saw in the previous slide to just over 46%. And on income splitting, um, finance did acknowledge that the existing draft legislation on dividend planning is complicated. And they said that they will simplify the rules and we'll see the new uh, rules in the fall. So in a week or so, we should hear more. Um, and hopefully we do see it uh, this month because these rules do take effect January 1st, 2018. So in Ontario, as an example, dentists are allowed to incorporate a professional corp with the dentist, their spouse, parents and kids as shareholders. We aren't going to go through you know, the concept of hygiene companies and other structures today, just in the interest of time. But currently, when we're planning for our tax clients um, at the beginning of each year, we take a look at the amount of money they need for personal living and any major expenses coming up in the near future. Then we review each existing shareholder's tax situations before any payment from the PC. We would then detail the dividends plans between all of the adult family shareholders advise on the taxes that will be owing by each shareholder, and finally let our client know how much tax they've saved by doing this dividend plan. You know, dividends were the best way to income split because we didn't have to deal with whether those dividends were reasonable. So if the corporation was structured properly, we simply have the ability to pay these dividends. Unfortunately, effective January 1, 2018, this type of planning will change. What finance has proposed is the concept of kitty tax on the payment of dividends to any related shareholders if the dividend is not considered reasonable. So in a dentistry professional corp, all shareholders are essentially related. The concept of kitty tax isn't new. You know, the concept of reasonability on dividends is new. So for those of you who have minor children, you would know that, you know, it doesn't make any sense to pay these minor children dividends because kitty tax typically would be triggered, which means that your child would have to pay the highest level of tax regardless of their tax bracket. And remember from the previous slide, the current highest level of tax on dividends is about 
the reasonability test on dividends is a drastic change, and finance is looking to test reasonability on two main categories. Number one, the amount of labor or work the shareholder has put into the practice, and two, the amount of capital contributed to the practice. They've also split the shareholders into two groups. Group one being those between the ages of 18 to 24, and group two, which is age 25 and older. So unfortunately for the 18 to 24 year olds, the tests are very, very difficult to meet. Finance likely took a stricter approach to this age group because this is where most of the dividends were being paid to help fund our children through university. The 18 to 24 year old shareholder has to work at the practice full time, which is virtually impossible to meet if they are in school. Or in order to receive a dividend, there would be a 1% dividend test, which means that in order to receive a $40,000 dividend, the shareholder would have to put in $4 million of capital into the corporation to justify that dividend. Again, very difficult to meet. Most of our dentists, and especially their children, simply don't have that much money in their hands personally. Now for the group over the age of 25, the rules aren't as strict, but they're also not as clear. They're still looking for reasonability, but don't specify what kind of labor or capital contributed is actually reasonable. So the onus is on you, the shareholder or the taxpayer, with the help of your accountants, to put together documentation as to how or why the dividend is reasonable. So let's look at an example of a dentist that has a professional court. In the first column, Right. If the dentist took out a salary of $200,000 from the PC and took the entire extra $200,000 dividend personally, they would have about $240,000 of after-tax money for personal living. In the second column, if we had a spouse that didn't earn any income and basically gave him or her that $200,000 dividend instead, while the dentist still takes the $200,000 salary, they would have about $275,000 in after-tax money. So just by income splitting with one spouse, we had tax savings of about $35,000. In the third column, if the dentist has a spouse, a child, and two parents with no income, we're able to split that dividend between four shareholders. And in this scenario, we would end up with $319,000 of after-tax funds. I mean, this scenario translates into a tax savings of about $79,000 every year. So the draft legislation is looking to wipe out these specific tax savings. Basically, if the draft passes and you're in the situation where you have been income splitting with four shareholders instead of pulling out $400,000 of personal income yourself, you would need to take out $571,000 of personal income instead. So taking away the $79,000 in tax savings. So most families will need to relook at their personal spendings with their accountants to figure out how to like, deal with this massive change. So there's tons of issues with these changes um, on the income splitting rules. At the end of the day, the government is ignoring the risk that business owners take on and want to draw parallels between employees and business owners. On the administrative side, this will be very difficult to implement because reasonability is a very vague concept. There's always going to be a risk if you want to pay out dividends to your family members. It will be very hard for CRA to apply these rules consistently. The concept of reasonability is constantly being tested in court. So as a result, the implementation will be extremely expensive both for you and for CRA, which is one of the reasons why finance said that they will provide more clarity at the end of fall. So hopefully there will be more guidance. We'll see. So what can you do now? You know, in terms of what we're doing with our clients, we're going through all of their tax situations, providing tax plans to top up on dividends before the end of 2017. So we're working through scenarios with tax consequences and potential savings so that we can help our clients come to a decision on how much more dividends to pay by December 31st of this year. We're also um, having preliminary conversations with our clients in terms of what can be done in 2018. So for example, what types of documentation to put together if we're going to continue to pay dividends or the possibility of paying salaries instead. We might be going back to traditional salaries like, or strategies like topping up on RSPs and IPPs um, are also being looked at as options. The reality is that tax planning options will still be available. They'll just be very different than what you are currently doing.
So your personal taxes will likely increase while you are still practicing. These rules will have an impact after retirement and finally on death as well. So with the help of your financial advisor and accountant, you will need to relook at your financial plan to figure out how to satisfy your personal spending needs, whether this delays retirement and finally whether you will be able to take care of your beneficiaries the same way after death. One piece of good news related to the income splitting rules is that in October, finance said that they will not be moving forward with eliminating the multiplication of the capital gains exemption limit. So huge effect for people that are looking at selling their practices. So step back for a bit. In July, the original proposal was that even if your professional corp is structured, such that your family members own the appropriate shares to use their capital gains exemption, CRA would still apply the 27% on the gain. So they're effectively ignoring the tax-free treatment. They have decided to drop that. So in this example, where we have a practice worth $3.2 million, and let's just say we have four shareholders that own the appropriate shares to use their capital gains exemption. So assuming that the professional court meets all of the rules, we would be able to save about $850,000 of tax. Because of the October amendment, we can still do this. So keep in mind that your PC and your shareholders have to meet certain rules to take advantage of the capital gains exemption. And if you don't meet these rules, you know, in this scenario, you'll end up paying $850,000 more in tax on sale. So current rules allow you to do it. You just need to make sure you're structured properly. In October, Finance said that they will be moving forward with the passive income rules in the 2018 budget. So they said that the existing passive assets in the professional court will be grandfathered and that any new money will be able to earn um, $50,000 in investment income before the new rules kick in. So unfortunately, because we haven't seen the draft legislation, there's a lot of uncertainty around how they're going to implement this. So we'll look at some possibilities over the next couple of slides. So if you look at the current system, the current tax system, it is structured so that the taxpayer should be indifferent in terms of where they're earning their investment income. So they basically pay the same level of tax whether they're earning the investment income in the corp or personally. The draft legislation, though, is looking to change that concept because finance doesn't like that. Corporations have the ability to save more money by saving in the corporation. Right? Instead, they want the taxpayer to be indifferent in terms of where they are saving their money, in effect trying to take away the tax deferral by saving inside a corporation. To implement this legislation, they're looking to take away the refundable tax pools and the capital dividend amount. So, I mean, these are complicated concepts. Without going into mechanics, this essentially means that this could result in a tax rate of as high as 73% on interest income. Now on dental income, I mean this example essentially shows that if it is active income, which means your practice income, there will be no change as a result of the existing rules, which is good. On passive income though, this is where the 73% tax kicks in. So currently by saving in the corporation, you have the ability to defer as much as 30 pay 38% of tax, which means that you have 38% more money to invest with if you saved in the corporation, because the small business tax rate inside a corporation is 15%, while the top personal tax rate on self-employment income is 53.5%. So the compounding effect is extremely powerful for retirement. If you look at the total wealth line, the draft legislation is looking to achieve similar total wealth, again, regardless of where you save your money. And they do this by removing the refundable tax pools. So as a result, this results in over 70% of tax. Now also keep in mind that this doesn't only apply to investment interest income, it also applies to capital gains. In terms of planning, the key thing here is that finance did specify the rules will apply on a go-forward basis. This legislation is going to be extremely tough to draft, and that's why we haven't actually seen the draft. Due to uncertainty, any planning today would be speculative. You know, we would encourage you not to jump into any major tax plans now in response to the passive income piece of the draft legislation. 
tax plans cost money, and they may not achieve the intended consequence once we act, have the actual legislation. Now, ultimately, when these rules come into play, we're expecting major changes in terms of how you plan to save for retirement. This will also change your current financial plan and your current tax plan. The reality is when we see the legislation, there will likely be tax planning you can do to offset some of these changes. In most circumstances, we would wait until we see the rules before we implement a tax plan. Now, on the sale of your practice, if the passive income rules pass, it will likely be very punitive to do an asset sale because a sale could be considered passive. This means that even without the ability to use a capital gains exemption, it could potentially be beneficial to structure the sale as a share sale. So the conversion of income into capital gains. This announcement in October is very good news. So in terms of background, in July, the government didn't like the ability for a taxpayer to structure their corporation to convert what would otherwise be a salary or dividend into a capital gain. The July draft legislation was looking to shut this down. However, the wording of the draft legislation had a whole bunch of unintended consequences that made it difficult for farmers to pass on the farm to the next generation and also results in double taxation on death. So finance said that they were not able to go through with the change um, and we'll be drafting new legislation in the 2018 budget to close the opportunity. So what does this mean? For those who have large personal spending needs or large one-time expenditures, this is potentially a very good planning opportunity. If we look at a numerical example, we're you know, essentially trying to take advantage of a difference between the 45% rate and the 27% rate. So, for somebody that might need a million dollars after tax to pay off a mortgage or buy a cottage or you know, fund a couple of years of living expenses, this plan could save about $450,000 in tax. And remember, it's time sensitive because this likely will get shut down in 2018 or in the spring 2018 budget. So with these major changes, many of our clients are asking whether incorporating a PC still makes sense. There are still advantages to having a corporation. You know, you still have lower corporate tax rates and the ability to lower some tax by saving in the professional corp. And since general practices are saleable, it is very beneficial to be able to use your capital gains exemption. And the only way to do that is by having a PC. So for planning on death, you can also defer taxes as well as save on probate taxes if you structure your wills properly with the help of a professional corp. Also remember that if you currently have a professional corp with a practice or savings or passive income inside, um, it will not make sense to move the asset out of, a, of, out of the corporation because it will trigger taxes. So in summary, what happens now? Number one, revise your income splitting plans now because the new rules will take into effect January 1st. Consider capital gains planning to take out money on a more tax-effective basis as soon as possible. Again, we are expecting that this will change in spring 2018, so this is the time to do it. And finally, we are going to hear more on the passive income side um, in the 2018 budget. So wait and see what the draft legislation will say before you go into any major tax plans related to that. So thank you everyone for listening. Um, you know, feel free to contact me if you like a consultation to look at your current tax plan or to look at potential planning opportunities available. We're more than happy to help. Great, thank you, Andrea. Thank you, everyone. anyone has any questions, feel free to, uh, you can type in in the, in the Q&A section there in the bottom right-hand corner. Andrea and I are available for any questions that anyone may have. Either that or you feel free to contact either of us uh, directly. I think our contact details were uh, listed here. I'll just pull it up on the, there we go. Well, great, Andrea, I guess thank you for your time, and uh, I look forward to hearing from anyone if you have any follow-up questions for either myself, Alan, or Andrea Chen. Thank you, everyone.